right, welcome back. In the last video, we got everything set up and we are ready to jump into the hanging part of this mechanic. If we double click to go into our player sprite, I'm going to right click over here in the animations panel and add another animation. And let's rename this hang. And over here at the top left, our load image from file. Let's go back into that. And we want the hang folder. And there's just the one sprite in there. So let's open. And there it is. Grab your origin tool and put it at the bottom. And I'm going to change that X to a 13. So we have 13 for the X and 65 for the Y. And then our collision box, I will right click on one of the nodes and set to bounding box. All right, make sure your speed is zero, no looping and all that good stuff. And we should be good to go for that one. I'm going to exit out of that. Okay, back on our layout, make sure that the player layer is highlighted and we can double click on the layout. And I want to add another sprite and we'll insert that. I'm going to change this to uh, 16 by 16. And I'll zoom in here. And I'm going to get my paint bucket tool and I'm going to pick a brown color. So over here in my HSL tab, uh, I'm just going to type in some values. And that's the brown color I'm going to go with. Of course, you can make it any color you want. And I'm just going to fill this. This is going to be our ledge object. And this part's really important. If we grab our origin tool, we want this to be in the top left corner. The way that we're going to make our code, it's going to reference this point no matter how many ledges are on screen, no matter what location the ledge is. If the origin point is in the top left, our code will work. If it's anywhere else, you will have to rewrite the code. With the origin point tool selected, if you have a number pad on your keyboard, seven, we'll put it in the top left. Otherwise, you can right click on origin, quick assign, and choose top left. We can exit out of that. With that still selected, I'm going to come up here and rename this ledge. And then I'm going to double click on the layout and add another sprite. And I'll change this to 16 by 16. This will get changed. Its size will get changed. It works better if it's in either the top left or top right, but it can be really anywhere. We're going to be moving this object and copies of this object around the screen and the code will not reference its origin point. Okay, I'm going to grab our paint bucket tool and get me a nice gray color. Uh, I'm just gonna type in some things here. That looks good. You can make yours any color you want. This will actually not appear on screen when we're done, only during testing. So I'm going to move our ledge down here and create a wall. And if I play this, I see how high she jumps. And because we have these squares made like this, we have a reference point. So I'm going to make my ledge object. Uh, I think I'm gonna go up to one, two, three, four squares. So I'll just drag that up so it's four squares high in reference to our background image. Okay, with our ledge object, selected over in the properties we can add a behavior add new behavior and pick solid that way she will interact with it and then i'm going to widen this ledge out something like that and remember our ledge the origin point is always in the top left corner when we start getting the code in place what we're going to be looking for is something that tells us to grab onto this ledge if we jump up, I don't want her to latch on to the ledge anywhere other than when she's close to the top. So that's why we have this sprite here. I did not name this, so let's go ahead and select it and rename it. I'm going to call mine ledge trigger. And this is going to just send us a trigger saying that you are in the right spot if you want to hang onto this ledge. Okay, I'm going to move this trigger into place and I'm going to turn off the snap to grid and come in here and I want it to be, I think, maybe like that because I don't want her to be able to trigger this hanging mechanic unless she's right up next to it. So over here in the size, I'm just going to clean this up a bit. 
uh, we'll round this width to six and the height to three. And it is almost flush with our ledge object. I'm just gonna move it over just like that. Okay, that should be good. You wanna end this general area. Precision placement isn't really all that necessary. Okay, let's go back over to the event sheet and I want to right click and add a new group and I'm gonna call this ledge hang and add an event to ledge hang and I'm going to check if our player is overlapping another object. And that object is going to be our ledge trigger. So now, anytime our player object is overlapping that ledge trigger object, we can run any code we want underneath this. And we're gonna do that by starting with a sub event directly under this. So what do we want to put in this sub event? Whenever our player jumps up and does make contact with this trigger, I don't want anything to happen unless we intend to grab onto the ledge. So if I just hit the W key and jump straight up, I don't want anything to happen even though she's overlapping. However, once we jump up and we're overlapping, if we are, say, pressing the direction towards the ledge, then that can indicate that we want to hang on to the ledge. So A for left, D for right. If I'm approaching the side of it, I jump up, I make contact with that, and I'm pressing D to move to the right still, then I wanna activate that hanging mechanic. So in the event sheet, let's highlight this whole block of code and press B to get a sub event. And let's go into that sub event and let's check for that D key. So keyboard key is down and that key is going to be the D. So now if we're overlapping the trigger and the D key is down, let's start hanging. So one of the things I've been putting in my recent projects to help break things down into more understandable blocks is creating states. And that's what we're going to do for our player. When this combination of events occur, I want to change or set the state in which our player is in. So let's go ahead and create a way to change states first. Let's click on our player object in the project panel and that'll bring up the properties and we can go to edit instance variables. Let's add a new instance variable and I'm going to call this one state. And this is going to be a string. We're going to have a total of three states for this particular project. All right. So once D is down, let's go ahead and change that state. So add an action, go into our player and let's get that instance variable and set value. We want the state and in between quotation marks, uh, let's just call this hanging. All right. So what happens when our state changes to hanging? Well, let's add a new event to our ledge hang group and go into our player and scroll down to our instance variables and we want to compare an instance variable and it is that state string. When it is equal to, in between quotation marks, our hanging variable that we just created, now we know if it is hanging, which we set it here, we can change what happens to our player. So let's add an action and go into our player and I wanna set the animation to hang. All right. I also want our player to be suspended in midair right there with that hanging animation. So we need to place her in the correct place. So let's just set her position. I'm going to add an action, go into player, and I'm going to type in set position and that is going to be the position of that ledge. So ledge.x for the x value and ledge.y for the y value. Now this isn't perfect yet, but you see what happens as soon as we came in contact with that trigger and we were pressing D, it put the player's sprite origin and matched it up with the ledge origin and our player sprite origin is at the bottom of her feet and the origin of the ledge is at the top left. So we need to account for that. So instead of ledge X and ledge Y, we need to add and subtract some uh, pixel distance to each one of these. 
So for the Y, I'm going to subtract the full height of our player sprite. So minus, I believe that was 65. And actually that would be plus 65 because we are moving her down the screen. So let's see what that does. So her hand is right there flush with the top of the ledge. So the, the height is correct, but she's buried by the ledge. So we can do a couple things here. Let's exit out of that over on the layout. I'm going to right click on our player, go to Z order and send to top of layer. That way she will overlap the ledge. It'll just look a little better. And then on the X, I want to move her back minus 10 pixels. So there we go. Uh, she jumps up and she grabs that ledge and she's in the right position right there. Okay, so that is uh, a ledge X minus 10 and ledge Y plus 65. So what's going to happen later on in the building of all this code is we're going to need to be able to set this ledge X and ledge Y to different positions. So instead of just setting this to these values right here, now that we know what these values need to be, I'm going to set them up in variables so we can use them again. So let's click on our player in the project panel and over here in the properties, edit instance variables and add a new one. I'm gonna call this ledge POS underscore X. That is going to be the X value of our ledge position and that will be a number. And I'll add another one, call this one ledge POS underscore Y. Now up here, the first time that we overlap a trigger while the D key is down, we can set those variables. So I'm going to add an action and go get our player and scroll down to the variables. And I want to set the value of ledge position X to ledge dot X. And that's going to be minus 10, just like we said down here. And then I'll add another action, get our player, scroll down, set the value ledge position y is going to be ledge dot y plus 65. Now we can go in here and set position to for the x value is going to be our player dot ledge position x and for the y will be our player dot ledge position y. And if we play that it should be exactly the same as we did before and it works. Okay, make sure you're saving. I keep forgetting to set that reminder out there. So now our player is stuck up there on the ledge and I want her to be able to fall down from the ledge if she lets go, which would mean that we, the player, let go of the D key. And we can check for that. We can actually check for if a key is released, but I only want this to happen if we're in the hanging state. So. Any other checks from the hanging state are going to have to be created in a sub event. So highlight this whole block of code, B on the keyboard to create a sub event. Let's double click to go into it and go into our keyboard on key released. And that key is going to be the D key. So the first thing I want to do is make sure that we're not in this hanging state anymore. I wanna take us back to our normal state which is going to be the one we start out in. So let's add an action, go get our player, and let's reset that value. So set value to our instance variable, and that's the state. So in between quotation marks, I'm just gonna call this uh, default. This will be our default state. So now we're no longer in the hanging state, so none of this is going to be able to take place. It won't be setting her position to the ledge anymore. So we've got out of that state, and she's going to be falling, so we need to make sure that we make it look like she is falling. And in our controls, we set it up for the jump animation, that second frame, which is actually frame one, because the first frame is frame zero. So let's add an action here, go into our player, and set that animation to the jump animation. And then we'll add another action, get the player and set the frame to frame one. Okay, what happens when we go to default other than just this part from when we release the key? Well, we wanna go back to our normal player controls. 
So what we really need to do is make sure that all of this only happens when we're in the default state that we set here. So up here in our player controls group, I'm going to add event to player controls, go to our player, scroll down and compare instance variable. And I want the state when it is equal to default. All of this can only happen when this is true. So that means this whole block has to be moved all the way to the top and everything else underneath it has to be a sub event of this check. So highlight all of these and click and drag up until that line indents underneath it. And when you release, everything should be a sub event of the default state. Okay, I'm gonna close that up. I know I said we weren't going to mess with the player controls group anymore, uh, but I promise that's the last thing we have to do, the player controls group. Okay, so in order for this player controls group default check to take place, we have to make sure that our player is set to default. And over here, our initial state, I leave this blank when it's a string especially, because it's just something we can do in code and have more control over. I'm going to create a new event outside of both of our groups and go into system and say on, on start of layout. And I'm going to move this whole block of code to the very top and add an action to it and go into our player, scroll down, set value of state to default. So now as soon as the game starts, we are in the default state, which means this is true. We can control our player. As soon as we're overlapping a ledge trigger and our D key is down, we change that state to hanging. And then we set these variables to their new values. Then once we are in the hanging state, we change the animation, we set the position. And then as long as we're hanging, everything's cool, except when we release the key, then we reset the variable back to default and change the animation. So once we hit the ground, all of this code should start taking place because we are now in the default state. And it will change the animation from our jump animation to our idle. Let's try that. All right, I'm gonna jump up. I'm hanging, I release the key and I fall. So, pretty cool. Uh, I also got rid of that being able to turn around the other way while we're hanging, so that's good. All right, looks good. Might as well go ahead and save again. All right, that one wasn't so bad. In the next video, we are going to move on to the climbing part. As always, if you are new to the channel and you're not subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up while you're at it. That's going to do it for this video, and I will see you in the next one.